Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Today I'm introducing Dr. Evelyn Thiel, who's going to talk presenting the role of the moral economy in North American small scale fisheries, confronting neoliberal policies. Dr. Pinkerton is a marine, mar maritime anthropologist and a professor at the Simon Fraser University at the, in the School of Research and Environmental Management. Her most recent work is known through her passionate research uh, on individual transferable quotas in relation to fairness and equity, in, especially for small-scale fisheries here in BC. Um, along the, and to understand the distribution of benefits in resource-dependent coastal communities. She has played a key role in developing the theory and the practice of power sharing and stewardship through co-management agreements, and her work has evolved into analysis of the developmental sequence of different types of co-management rights and activities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pink. Well, thank you. I always love to come back to the Fisheries Center. I, there's such great colleagues here, and my students so much enjoy coming here. This is where they really find a lot to share in common. Um, so, these are the general research questions that I obviously won't have time to completely address, but this is just to give you a context or uh, a way of thinking about the moral economy, uh, not only um, you know, what they, what their, what, pra what moral economic practices are, but uh, what's happened to them in North America, and how how might they be um, expanded because they have been very marginalized and rebellion. Um, so, what is a moral economy? So, it's the norms, practices. Uh, and I'm going to talk especially about those related to equitable economic opportunity. Um, and, and they have much larger um, consequences for society in general. Um, and so this is just a brief history of who's used the term. The Russian economist was really looking at Russian peasants and how they only produced enough for themselves. They really weren't interested in making profits. And, Social historian E.P. Thompson, whom you may know as the famous author of The Making of the English Working Class, wrote a wonderful piece on the moral economy of the English crowd, where he talked about the fact that the food riots in England in the 18th century were from um, peasants or small producers who couldn't get enough to eat because the landlords were selling the food at higher prices on the market. In other words, they were saying, we have a moral right to food at a just price. You can't do this to us. You can't speculate on a basic necessity like food. Um, and anthropologist, political economist James Scott wrote about the moral economy of the Asian. So, so, so these were the some of the really foundational writers about the moral economy. And all of them talked about also the right of small producers to a subsistence economy, that is just getting enough to eat, being able to produce enough to eat by what they did. Um, and so there, uh, there's not room to go through all of the international uh, bodies that have talked about this. So just the latest, which I'm sure you've heard Ratana talk about when she was here, um, the voluntary guidelines for uh, small-scale fisheries getting at least food security. So a, a lot of uh, the moral economic principles are actually supported by international agreements. Um, and what, what I'll really come off of, though, is the enormous maritime anthropology and sociology literature on the moral economy. It's been extremely well documented all over the world. And these are just three of those that I just sort of picked randomly. This real classic, Raymond Firth's Malay Fisherman, uh, has a whole chapter on the share system. It's unbelievably complicated how you divide it and catch among uh, everybody who, who took part in the fishery. Um, this Hess book is a wonderful book about um, incredible institutions in Basque Country in Spain where they had they, they took care, they had maritime insurance, they took care of everybody. Everybody was taken care of by uh, the fishermen who fish the local waters and sort of control everything. And then this last one is about Norway, Sweden, Newfoundland, uh, everything that they did. 
So many dimensions, of course, to the moral economy. Um, but I'm going to talk about just the last one, uh, equity in sharing the benefits. And especially these three ways that the moral economy shows up today, because these are three very contemporary ways that it's affected. How the share system works, you know, how the catch is divided among, among everybody, uh, how uh, fishing opportunity is allocated, that is what gear types get what access to what fish, that would be particularly true in the salmon fishery. I'm going to talk about the first one, I'm going to talk about the halibut fishery, the second one, I'm going to talk about the salmon fishery, the third one, the, the, the salmon fishery again. And then how can fishermen get a fair price for their fish? Um, and so um, how have the, I'm going to talk about how these three, how these three elements of the moral economy have been undermined by neoliberal policies, uh, but how moral beliefs and values about their fairness, about fairness and equity persist, whatever the po current policies are. And then how can these three elements uh, be expanded? Um, and just briefly, what's, what, what am I talking about when I say neoliberalism? <coughs> so it's just uh, this emphasis on private property, economic efficiency, government cutbacks, devolution of responsibilities. Especially important is the idea that uh, that neoliberal thinkers want to remove all barriers to capital accumulation, to scale back taxes, regulation, and grant new rights and freedoms to private companies. And so this quote at the bottom is, uh, uh, I mean, this, this truly is a moral belief with neoliberal thinkers, so I don't want to, I don't want to give the impression that this is, um, you know, I mean, there, there are people who truly believe that uh, self-interested entrepreneurs efficiently coordinated in self regulating markets actually produce better welfare. I will argue, of course, that it doesn't produce better welfare, but that they sincerely believe you do. And, and the marketization is, of course, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but uh, marketization of just about everything that you can, and especially downloading risks and responsibilities onto individuals. So when you buy something and you go through 12 pages of small print and then you're supposed to sign, check the I agree box, that's the neoliberal downloading, downloading of responsibilities. They don't have to reinforce any of these regulations because you've agreed that you're going to take responsibility for whatever got sold to you. Uh, so basically, neoliberal political philosophy is about the right not to be interfered with by the state and regulation. And moral economy is about, is about the right to basic welfare and equal economic opportunity. So you could think of these as two different um, economic philosophies. Um, so let, let's talk about, this is the first one, the share system. Um, and so it's about, you know, what, what percentage gets, like you wouldn't believe in the, in the Firth Malay fishermen, you know, the, there's a percentage uh, to the guy who carries the fish to the market and, and all, everybody stands around, the, the wives and the family stand around and, and the, everybody watches like a hawk while everything is divided up. So this the share system uh, that's, that was true on all fisheries uh, in modern times, in the 20th and the 21st century, is just fundamental to fishing morality because people risk their lives at sea together and there's a pretty high fatality rate and accident rate. Uh, so this is, this is not just casual labor, it's really... Um, um, and, and so the, the point I want to emphasize here is that the share system has always been sufficient to allow a crew member to accumulate enough cash to buy a boat and to set him or himself or herself up as a skipper. So what, what's important about this is that it really is about a moral order. In other words, the share system is a way that people can progress by working hard and assume adult economic roles. In other words, if you're a crew member, you can expect to become a skipper. It's part of the deal. You are working your way up the ladder by hard work. So it's about a moral order about how people assume adult economic roles. It isn't just casual wage labor. Uh, and so the share system was abolished by ITQs and BC halibut fisheries. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. So um, the majority of, of people who actually fish are, are renting quotas or leasing quotas. and. So what a crew might be paid has gone from like 10 to 20 percent to 1 to 5 percent. Uh, and um, so 
basically you, the, the moral order has been radically changed. Uh, a young, a young crew, crewman can no longer expect to be able to become a skipper. He simply, he or she simply can't accumulate enough to to get there. Uh, and so I think what's interesting is that there's been a moral response to this um, that actually just this just happened this year, which is that there's a there's a board of halibut fishermen, which is mostly made up of quota holders. Uh, and so people who don't hold quota got on the board, and, and they're supposed to work with DFO to co-manage the halibut fishery. And so um, a bunch of people who were, a bunch of fishermen who were really upset about the situation of uh, the share system changing, and, and, and also the, the basically the high cost of leasing quota, because the cost of leasing quota is so high now, it's become a speculative market, an ideal ne neoliberal situation, according to neoliberal thinkers, um, that basically uh, you, you can just barely scrape by if you're leasing a very high percentage of your quota. So uh, these, these fishermen tried to get on the board and tried to raise this issue on the board, and they simply got nowhere. The, uh, the majority of board members simply were not willing to talk about this issue. So they've joined the Canadian Independent Fish Harvesters Federation, which is, which is linked to fishermen and fishing associations on the east coast of Canada, where there's a much stronger political movement to have owner-operator fleets, fleet separation, and a bunch of policies which are more geared toward equitable, equitable distribution of fishing benefits to people who actually fish, as opposed to people who own quotas. And this, these folks actually have the ear of a minister who uh, is said that who is said not to really like the T in ITQs. Uh, so, just that the, you know, there's a moral outrage that's having some impact and that may have some <coughs> impact. Um, so this is number two. So the share system was number one. This is number two of moral economic principles that I'm going to talk about. So this is about. Who, who gets which gear types, this is in the salmon fishery, so which gear types, the small and the large, get what kind of opportunity to fish? And so I just want to start by making a comment that the Davis Plan uh, in 1968, which was the first fleet rationalization plan, just started out by saying, okay, we're going to get rid of all the boats that caught less than $2,500 in a year. That was just a given of the plan. There wasn't even any choice about it. And so I think it's really important to, I'm going to come back to that, you know, who are you kicking out of the fleet just for starters to be efficient? Are you really kicking out the people who are creating the biggest problems in efficiency, uh, uh, the guys who only catch this much fish? Um, but anyway, so those, those, those folks were kicked out and then the remaining um, gill net and troll boats, the smaller salmon boats, uh, decreased by 25 and 14, and the same, the larger same boats increased by 30. And so that was sort of the first phase of what you might call neoliberal thinking uh, affecting the fleet um, in that um, that was geared toward, uh, you know, too many boats chasing too few fish. But, but the goal was, to, of course, to create efficiency by putting the fishing effort into a few, fewer larger boats. And the Mifflin Plan of 96, uh, went further in this um, and allowed it, allowed even further concentration of the remaining licenses. And so, of course, one of the impacts of this was that more and more of the boats uh, came under processor control uh, because the larger boats, uh, the majority of the same fleet is, um, is controlled or owned by the same fishery. And then this traditional formula of distribution among the fleet, 22% to troll, 38% to gillnet, and 42% uh, is to be rigidly adhered to um, in the past for, for a very long time. And that gradually began to fall away after the Mifflin plan. Uh, the, the, uh, the formula just got too complicated, and it was more and more, and more difficult for fishermen to keep track of who was getting what and to do the catch-up makeup, which they traditionally did. If, you, if, you know, if, you, if the catch wasn't exactly there, that sector got more the following year to, to make up for what they had. So, um, this is, um, there isn't a really clear response to this one, but just in general, there is a, um, a very strong opposition by the 
Fisherman's Union and the Native Brotherhood to the proposal to ITQ salmon, which um, seems to be pretty strong push from government. Uh, it's that they postponed it after very strong pushback. Um, and so you can just say that there's a moral <laughs> response, not necessarily in the salmon fishery, but to, but to ITQs, that uh, people are using feudal terms to describe uh, what's happening in the fishery. This is actually all over the world where there are ITQs, that people use these feudal terms, serfs, and fish lords. Um, and so the third, the third element, I'm not going to talk very much about because um, uh, you have a, a student here at the Fishery Center who's doing, who's doing work on this, and I think he's doing a great job. I've seen her present on it. So it's, um, it's about bar the bargaining power of fishermen uh, for a fair price. And um, originally, uh, dur during the original Davis Plan limited entry program, there was a 12% cap on corporate ownership of fishing licenses. That's been completely abandoned um, under neoliberal thinking. and. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty clear that uh, there's there's very ex there's excessive corporate control that uh, gives oligopsony to the fleet under both under ITQs and even non ITQs. But but I'm not going to talk about that because you're not doing it's doing such good work on it. Um, so how could so what I want to ask is how could these three elements um, how could they have been undermined by neoliberal policies? What didn't neoliberal thinkers understand about uh, fisheries in general and small-scale fisheries in particular? So there are just three elements I want to briefly mention. Um, the way they thought about efficiency. Um, I mean, first of all, <laughs> you know, the, the it, it was, it's been clearly, clearly established that the returns to capital were worse after the Davis plan. Um, it's been clearly established that under ITQs, uh, overinvestment has just shifted to the quotas, uh, you know, overcapitalization, uh, which was supposed to be the big problem that was solved. So overcapitalization, the quotas now are so expensive that nobody can afford them except outside investors. Um, and um, small-scale small -scale boats have um, lower capital costs per cash than large boats. That's been pretty well established. And it's not, if you look at efficiency as just, you know, what kind of boat should you have catching what few fish, um, there are many uh, dispersed and smaller and higher value stocks that uh, just aren't most efficiently pursued by large, um, by large boats. Um, so that, that was um, efficiency. Uh, if you look at conservation, um, do you really think that the uh, boats earning $2,500 a year were the biggest threat to conservation? I don't think so. Um, small, there's been lots of literature on this. Daniel Pauly and um, um, Jacket have published a, a lot of stuff on this uh, internationally. So this is just for, for Canada, for North America. But uh, small-scale fisheries use less fuel per, per fish caught. They use less destructive gear. Uh, they can use less destructive gear. Not all of them always do. but. Um, but I, th I would say, as a rule, they, they do. Um, and the, and this, is, this third one's a really important one. They're not, or the fourth one, they're not <coughs> forced to fish for a processor if they're more independent uh, to keep their markets supplied when the price is low. When the price is low, they can shift their effort and just let the fish rest, which is certainly good for, uh, for conservation. And the higher financial stress from ITQs um, <coughs> really inc increases the compliance risk because if, if most of the people fishing don't own the quota, um, all the claims about quota increasing stewardship simply don't apply. Uh, th there's been a large body of literature that said, well, ITQs increase stewardship and therefore they're good for conservation. And this isn't true. It just can't be the case if you look at who actually owns them, who's actually fishing and how much ownership of the quota they actually have. In other words, the, the, the economic principle that ownership create stewardship um, can't be the case in this And then what about well-being, which is supposed to be the goal of, of any um, economy? It's supposed to create well-being for citizens. So um, the capacity of coastal communities uh, to be self-supporting, which used to be the case uh, before the neoliberal regime uh, got going, um, 
is, is a huge asset when you have recession or tough economic times. It's really helpful to have people being able to take care of themselves and not be completely dependent on state support. Um, employment, uh, uh, you know, economists, a lot of economists think that it's bad to have, to employ more fish, more people per fish sold, as is the case in small-scale fisheries. But you could certainly argue the opposite in terms of both welfare and in terms of economic stability. That you want more people employed, you get more people employed, you have more people consuming, you have an economic engine turning. Um, but this is the third point is I think one of the most important is that small scale fisheries can ad adapt the best of any fisheries to economic and ecological sh shocks because they're more diverse. They have uh, really different patterns of asset holdings and they don't have these huge capital debts, huge, huge capital investments and debts that they have to service which makes them um, just not be able to, um, to deal with uh, cutbacks, both economic and ecological. And so just, I, I wanted just to, I wanted to ask you to think about, about this one because um, if you can see the dates, uh, things start to, this is, the, this is for the US, I'm gonna show you Canada in just a minute. But this is based on uh, Thomas Piketty's work on income taxes, um, which, which revolution, so this is the top, this is what the top 10% of Americans uh, take home, in other words, what their income is. And as you can see, um, it used to be really high in the roaring 20s. Uh, then there was the Great Depression, uh, and then there was the, uh, the prosper prosperous period from the 50s to the 70s, through the 70s, and then the 80s, when neoliberal thinking started to come in, um, inequality started to really rise, and um, it's continued to rise. And so this is the top 10%. If you looked at the top 1%, it would be about half of this. In other words, of the top 10%, the top 1% get half of that. So there's kind of an escalating curve of inequality. Now, if you look at Canada, I bet a lot of you think Canada's going to be a lot better than this. Raise your hand if you think Canada's curve is going to look really different. <laughs> OK, here you go. I can make this thing go. OK, here's Canada curve. So Canada curve, it has two differences. The, this is the top 10%. The inequality isn't quite as bad because instead of being 50%, it's more like, you know, 40, it's closer to 40%. Somebody maybe can tell me what this LAD is. I got this off of Thomas Piketty's webpage, so I haven't yet discovered what LAD is. So if someone knows, please tell me that's the blue curve. So maybe you can just look at the red curve. I guess they stopped collecting data with the red red source of data, but um, you can see that the inequality started happening about 15 years later in Canada than the U.S., and the inequality is about 10% less. Well, you know, maybe Canada's going to catch up, I don't know. Uh, maybe you can think of when uh, neoliberal, when we began to have neoliberal governance. And certainly in fisheries, uh, if you think of when Romeo LeBlanc was fisheries minister and was doing all kinds of things like setting up uh, co-ops in Newfoundland and Labrador that would get a share of the offshore shrimp fishery, uh, he was doing all kinds of things that were very, very not neoliberal, you know, well into um, the 80s and so, or 70s and the 80s. So, so Canada's uh, neoliberal governance lasted, I'm uh, sorry, Canada's not neoliberal governance lasted quite a bit longer than it lasted in the U.S. So perhaps that's a lot of what's going on here. And so I just want to, <laughs> I can't resist mentioning that, um, you know, maybe part of the pushback that I'm talking about, you know, how, how does, how do we, um, how can there be a pushback on neoliberal thinking? And some of the pushback, amazingly, is coming from economists who are saying that inequality is really bad for the economy. And so some of this is just common sense, which is that if you don't have people consuming, then how is the economy going to keep going? Uh, this is why um, in the Great Depression, uh, the thinking was very much to, uh, you know, to bring in all sorts of economic stimulus. That's, that's what economic, economic stimulus is all about. 
Um, but there's, there's a special issue of The Economist, which everybody ought to read, which came out in 2012, which had a whole series of essays on why inequality is bad for the economy. And of course, some of this is just, is just that they're talking about economic growth. They say, well, you can't grow the economy um, if you don't have more consumption and more people making a lot of money. But um, I, I want to ask you to think about you know, ecologically, we're, we're in a time with climate change. <coughs> maybe we shouldn't be thinking about growth as the main goal. Maybe we should just be thinking about um, stability and resilience. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to take, this is, there's, this is still more thinking about this. Uh, look, at, look at the last one. Three dozen economists, the majority of them, say that economic inequality is harming the economy and that the next recession is three to five years away. So just kind of sobering that, um, we, we, may, we may really need, um, I think we really need uh, to go back to uh, some fisheries that do more things for us and don't just um, collect benefits for the wealthiest 10%. And so just, just to conclude, um, I think I've taken just about half an hour just about what you, what you asked. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think it can be argued that small-scale fisheries serve the public good by getting the most overall value, employment out of a publicly owned resource, and by maintaining an opportunity for people to be self-directed, self-supporting, and earning enough money to spend in coastal communities and, and also in, uh, you know, in the country at large. They have a smaller ecological footprint. They spread the benefits of fishing more broadly and equitably, and they're more adaptable to climate change and recession. So don't we need more of this instead of the other to face the future? Um, and so, you know, just caveats, how <coughs> could the moral economy of fishing be expanded? Because as I think I said earlier, um, people who look at the moral economy talk about the fact that there is always a moral economy in any, in any economy. There's always a moral economy. The question is, how large is it, and can it, and is it shrinking or expanding? And so, the, I mean, countries couldn't exist without claiming that they have some kind of moral, moral philosophy. Um, and so, you know, just um, some thoughts about uh, what, on what grounds, people can argue for the expansion of the moral economy. Um, just, you know, be careful what you mean about efficiency. You might get what you wish for. Uh, and that overcapitalization, uh, you know, this thing that we always talk about in fisheries management, is just shifted to another place. It hasn't disappeared. Um, and it's just created a different kind of problem. And that the, um, you know, the I haven't even had time to talk about the impacts of inequality on society, but there's quite a literature. There's a wonderful book by Wil Wilkinson and Pickett, the spirit level. He spoke uh, about five years ago at SFU's downtown campus. And uh, you know, inequality is correlated with all of the horrible indicators of social ills that you want, you want to think of. Um, and so th these, have, these are costly. So, so we've transferred costs to other places when we create. So just a last thought about um, public outrage uh, in the U.S., um, you might recall that the moral economy took it took the took the shape of of creating a phrase the one percent and the ninety nine percent, and that's kind of stuck. And I, I don't think anyone's figured out what to do about it yet, but it's there and it's in people's minds as an idea. Um, and so um, when the Economist starts writing. Um, articles about fair treatment and about the fact that this, this is about Americans. And I, I'd like to hear more about what you think is happening in Canada. When The Economist writes articles about the fact that um, everyone has the right to fair treatment and quality of opportunity and that this isn't happening anymore, I think, you know, I think you've got something to build on. So I want to thank you for having me and for keeping alive the conversation at the Fishery Center that, uh, that my students just love to come to. Hi, 
on, on your shield now, I'm a researcher and I'm also an anthropologist as well. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, the, the concern about expansion of neoliberalism is, is also pointed out by uh, Ruddle and Anthony Davis as well. And yes, I, 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 they have wonderful work. Yes, they have more of the idea of human rights and, and which we thought is supporting for the small scale uh, fishery, but yet it works in the opposite. And it, 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 I think your um, kind of sort of like captures the other aspect of it, which is um, kind of like a shared system collapse. Uh, uh, the, the people actually don't see much of the, the community value in fisheries, but just to see it, it's a system to produce or harvest the fisheries, which uh, might not necessarily always true. So my question is, when I see the, the, um, how much of these SAF or these uh, uh, non skipo kind of like a boat deckhands uh, actually take, um, decrease from 10% to the 1% of the total profit, um, I wonder, did it actually happen because the fishermen couldn't catch as much as they could catch before and because of the strict ESC or, or was it just simply the way the quarter, uh, um, the lease of quarter um, becomes really sort of like high and if we actually, there's a system uh, um, to stop the transfer of quarter, um, uh, the price of transfer of quarter to be uh, not so high, uh, if we implement uh, some sort of like a system to stop the transfer of water to be in, in, in hands, uh, um, not for the market dealers. Do you think that would actually change back to the more normal <coughs> system? I, I, I agree it would. You've asked several questions. So the reason... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's fine. good. No, that's fine. Right. No, that's efficient. <laughs> Um, so the reason that the deckhands' wages have gone down is not because the catch is lower or less valuable. The catch value has increased, uh, and the if you have an ITQ, uh, you're getting a guaranteed share of the catch, or, or you're, you have the right to get a guaranteed share of the catch. So that's certainly not the issue. The issue is that the majority of fishermen now have to lease uh, a percent of their quota. So, some fishermen own some of their quota and then they lease some percent of it. So if you lease, um, what's happened is that the accounting practices in the fishery have completely changed because even if people own their own quota, they deduct from the cruise share what they <coughs> could have gotten by leasing the quota. In other words, the price of lease quota, which has become, according to a report by Nelson in 2011, I think, um, the lease price of halibut quota is 72% of the landed value of the quota, which means that you have to pay so much just in leasing the quota that there's very little room to make a profit on top of that. So if you own your quota, you're in good shape. You can do very well. But if you have to lease it, which the majority now do, you have to pay so much to lease it that um, there's not a whole lot left over. To, to, to pay your crew, and um, so uh, so what? So I think that answers one of your questions. No, that's so, pretty much it. That's yeah. Right. So so I think you were asking what can be done about that. So on the East Coast, they've tried very hard to prevent that by saying that there has to be an owner operator. Now I just mentioned that on the West Coast, even if you own your quota now. Most fishermen are deducting what they could earn from, from leasing their quota out. They're deducting it from what they pay their crew. So even quota owners are doing it uh, just because it's become standard industry, industry practice. Um, there are a few who don't. Uh, I, just a bit of time. But, um, so the owner-operator policy and the fleet separation policy on the East Coast and, and in Alaska with the halibut fishery, they have an owner on board policy, which be, you know, uh, sometimes the owners get on board and watch television, <laughs> don't, don't do any fishing. But anyway, it's an attempt to, so there are, there are, there are various attempts right. to prevent the leasing of quota, which is one of the major ways. Right. Um, I, I was uh, Friday and Saturday in New York at a conference organized by a German foundation that is affiliated with the German far left party. And, um, uh, this is the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. It tells you everything about their orientation. And one of the speakers was Seth Martin Mashinko, yes. uh, who is a professor uh, at Rhode Island and who 
argues very strongly that uh, the privatization of the of a common is uh, something that uh, is to be bemoaned. And he, uh, among other things, he listed uh, uh, big NGOs, environmental NGO like uh, like. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund. And the um, EDF, uh, that is funded by a major corporation in the US and foundation, like the Walton Foundation of Walmart, that <coughs> are engaging in uh, total privatization of uh, a common resource. And it is happening in the States uh, on a rapid scale. And Jane Lubchenco, in a, during a tenure at, as, at NOAA, was pushing this gut share, which is about not sharing, and uh, also internationally. And uh, it, it is rather, the BC example is, is just one. It is rather, one has the impression that it is a conspiracy, <coughs> that it, but it is quite open. Um, and it is a practice on a giant scale. And it also you know, has taken over all uh, institutions, like FAO, like uh, Obviously, the European Union and so on. This is uh, uh, quite frightening. This uh, privatization uh, of a uh, common. I, I quite agree, and it is it is on a very uh, large scale. And I was very disappointed when Jane Lubchenco came out and supported it in 2010. Uh, and it's still there's still a lot of dispute in the U.S., which is very interesting. Uh, the, it's, it's odd that um, the neoliberal agenda in fisheries started earlier in Canada than the U.S. Uh, and there's been, more but there's been more opposition to it in the U.S., even though I would say Canada, well, we just saw Canada is a more egalitarian country than the U.S. Uh, but um, maybe Canada is more vulnerable, too. But you're quite right, Daniel, that it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. The EU has um, privatized quite Quite a, I mean, has ITQ quite a few fisheries. It's interesting, though, that the Netherlands, which is one of the first countries to bring in ITQs, has backed way off it. They they will not allow transferability except within a, a private group, a, a very small group. In other words, they don't just allow transferability anywhere. As as you know, in in uh, New Zealand. Is the extreme other end, and <laughs> nobody even wants to mention New Zealand. It's so horrible. In New Zealand, the ITQs for the offshore fishery are leased to South, um, Korea. South Korea, South Korea, and China. I think. Uh, and they there was a huge scandal in Korea in uh, uh, New Zealand two years ago because it was because they were just oh my God, they were hiring. Crew from Singapore, Indonesia. pardon? Indonesia. Indonesia, and the crew were—they were not being paid. They were being sexually abused. They were—it was horrible. And they blew. Everybody in New Zealand found out about it because they got blown in by a storm. And some of the crew escaped. They were actually being almost imprisoned on the boat. So it was—it was an extreme case. And and the and the fish were being processed in Singapore. I think. So the fish were not even being processed in New Zealand. So that's kind of an extreme case of privatization and marketization, being able to transfer a quota anywhere. ITQs are basically making the right to fish something that can be sold like stocks on the stock market so that um, it means that they can be sold to another country and what you think of as your common good, uh, the benefits, the processing, can be done somewhere else. And so it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, well, Gosh, I thought we owned this fishery. I thought it belonged to this country. Well, no, it doesn't. If you have, if you have ITQs, and so New Zealand is sort of the, the, the worst illustration of what can happen. That. Um, yeah. Who? Who? I was basically. Yes. Well, you, know, you, you struck a real chord there when you said that this whole neoliberal agenda and argument has, has now become a religious thing. I noticed that very strong. What keeps getting Republicans elected in the United States? The people that elect Republicans are not those rich people, and the money they pour into uh, their political campaigns isn't what gets them elected. What gets them elected is an enormous subpopulation in America of 
of Christians. And what I found living in Florida half the year that trying to talk to my neighbors about politics and e economics was exactly the same thing as trying to talk to them about evolution. I would get exactly the same reaction from them in, in discussions of evolution and, and biology, because it's all fundamentalist Christians, as I got trying to talk about sensible economics. And they got very upset when I pointed out that their neoliberal political attitudes are exactly contrary to their Christian beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, people are incredibly known to, to contradict, to live in, the, in ways that are inter, internally contradictory like that. Uh, it's horrible. I don't see any way to get out of this. <laughs> Let's keep talking about that, I mean, rather than me trying to write an answer. So let's get lots of questions. So this is somewhat changed the international mood for this, uh, especially Iceland is clawing back this ice cube. Why does DFO still promote ice cubes? Okay. Um, I've got an elaborate explanation for that in a 2013 paper on, on the layup system. Um, I think that they're, there's a, they're very good explanations. I mean, you can, you can say on the one hand that DFO you know, might have some ideology uh, that way because they did hire your peers to do their 1982 World Commission, West Coast, for example. Uh, but that's certainly not the only thing pushing DFO. One thing pushing DFO is that uh, they've had their budget cut way back, year after year after year. And uh, what's the easiest way to deal with budget cuts? It's to download costs onto fishermen. So uh, Tom Tietenberg, an economist, has said that, that usually ITQs are made acceptable to the first generation of fishermen by allowing them to capture the major benefits. And so the first generation of fishermen who get grandfathered into ITQs for free have basically inherited a huge public good, which they can then sell for a million dollars. So, so basically, you know, who wouldn't who wouldn't take this deal? So I actually think it's amazing that a lot of that so many fishermen oppose ITQs when they could get a windfall profit from from getting them. So the first generation of fishermen, you know, gets them and then passes on the cost to all future generations, making it very difficult for young people to get into the fishery um, because then they have to pay all these costs. So. So, the, so because the first generation has gotten a windfall, they become willing to accept the cost of monitoring and enforcement. So they take all these expensive monitoring equipment on their boats. You know, I, I kind of have to giggle when, when people say, oh, they're so, ITQs are so good at conservation because people will then monitor themselves and they, will, they, will, they won't do anything. Well, the opposite is turned out to be true. There's like, it's the, the expense of monitoring has gone up. And DFO, 2009, withdrew any contribution they were making to the cost of monitoring. So um, uh, someone, I, I, I can't use names, but um, someone in DFO told me after the halibut and ITQ programs had, had come in, that they were paying for the entire cost of the Pacific ground fish fishery. And so, in other words, costs were being recovered sufficient to, uh, to cover DFO's costs. So there's, there's a downloading of, I mentioned, you know, downloading of risks and responsibilities, and that's, that's a neoliberal um, philosophy, that people's citizens should take responsibility for running their own lives. There's, there's such interesting contradictions in neoliberalism, though, because um, a, bu a bunch of colleagues, I, uh, Ratana and I organized a workshop here at the Fishery Center last year, and now we're finally coming out with the papers. They're just about to come out, and so <laughs> it's very funny that St Steve Langman has a contribution on Alaska and the attempt by Alaska small-scale fisheries to open uh, surpluses that regularly appear on small streams. Well, 
there's huge resistance from the, you know, you'd think that could be an example of, of well, downloading responsibilities and risks. Why doesn't, why don't neoliberal managers think, well, you know, they could, that would be a really good idea. You could have small, efficient fisheries on small, on small surpluses. Nope, <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Alaskan Department of Fish and Game will have none of it. <laughs> so um, all of these villages, which are near these surpluses of salmon, <coughs> surpluses are foregone because uh, they're not set up in a way that they can do it. Another element in that is that there isn't enough staff in ADF and G anymore to really pay attention to it and to feel comfortable overseeing it. So there are two elements, cutbacks in government personnel and the belief that, well, sometimes you can trust people and delegate, but sometimes you can't. <laughs> um, I think Joy had a question first and then I'd after, so those are the last two questions. Okay. Okay, so if we have more, we, if we have more small-scale fishers and less corporate control, do you think the cost of management would be lower? Yes. Well, if you if you evolve toward a system of co-management, you can do a lot in that department because because and which is another whole topic to talk about now. But um, if fishermen fish and fishermen's organizations are willing to a huge amount of volunteer effort if they have some real say in the fishery. You can get a big bang for the buck, just huge. And so I gave a talk a couple of years ago on the layup system. <coughs> that the cost of that, there was zero cost to government of that. Fishermen tax themselves and regulate themselves completely. Uh, and so, I mean, it was, it was a real win for government to not, not incur any of these costs. And the International Halibut Commission really wanted them to. Anyway, so was that all of your question or was yeah. it? Okay. One more question, our last question. Um, are you in favor of limiting the number of licenses? You know, that's a really hard question because um, I, I, have a, I have a constant debate with uh, my friend Steve Langdon who, who really is against limited entry period because if, if you look at the history, as soon as you got limited entry, you started to have a huge investment in boats and overcapitalization and all of the bad things happened that, that was supposed to be not what happened with limited entry. And there are fisheries that are not limited entry which are doing quite well. Uh, there, there, there are state managed fisheries in the US that, are, that, are, that have refused limited entry that don't have the problems. And so I think it's a very difficult question. I'm not sure that I do. And so, obviously, when, you know, I mean, the halibut fishery is, is, is the hard case, isn't it? Because there was this huge buildup of the halibut fleet. But partly that was because people at that time could have a halibut and a salmon license, so it went with the buildup of the salmon fleet. And so. There'd be a huge buildup of the salmon fleet. There was. In the 1800s, there were 1,300 filmmakers fishing the skin. Yeah. And I mean, that was just silly. Or that the dividing up the benefits would be equally disastrous in terms of the amount of money that an individual fisherman would make. But, but, but if, a, if, if there's no profits, then the fisherman will seek a different economic opportunity, right? Like, you know, if you're going to go fishing, you have to think about your opportunity cost. As well as your, uh, as well as your profits. Well, you gave the right answer. <laughs> I think we're out of time. That was <laughs>